today we have with us dr alex kwan from dr alex kwan is an associate professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at yale university he was born and raised in hong kong he received his bsc in engineering physics from simon fraser university and he and and a phd in applied physics from cornell university At Cornell, he developed non-linear optical microscopes in the laboratory of Watt Webb. For his postdoctoral studies as a Croucher Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, he worked in the laboratory of Yan Dan, where he studied cortical microcircuits. Then, in the year 2013, he joined the Yale School of Med Medicine as a faculty. The research in his lab focuses on mouse medial frontal cortex. He is interested in how cortical circuits enable flexible decision making and how the dendritic dysfunctions underlie neuropsychiatric disorders. Also, his lab works in developing and applying optical tools to record and control the neural activity in the behaving mice. With that, uh, in, uh, with that small introduction, the title of this talk is "Visualizing the Rapid and Long-Lasting Actions of Drugs in the Brain." he will be talking about his lab interest in determining how the brain responds to the psycho psychoactive drugs now being from a physics background myself i find dr alex kwan's journey very interesting as i personally feel that sometimes when i'm uh, focusing on the field of neuroscience uh, my experience with physics uh, overlaps with a lot of things that dr alex is doing in his research and so i'm really very excited for his talk so with that short introduction i would like to introduce uh, and welcome dr alex to kindly present his talk thank you so much for joining us everyone try to share my screen yeah is it showing Yes, yes. Good. Good. Well, yeah. Well, thank you Ruth for the introduction. Uh that was very kind. Um Thank you. Yeah, I think uh uh you know, I I have a physics and engineering background and switched to neuroscience and um you know, I think it's it's quite valuable to have different perspective uh in the study of neuroscience. I think we each bring different um skills and expertise to the table. Um so yeah, as as Ruth mentioned, uh is early morning here. It's about 7:00 Thirty, I think. So I'm usually not a morning person. So I hope I keep my energy up. Uh, I have already drank a few cups of coffee, so we should be good to go. <laughs> um, but I'm quite glad to tell you uh, some of the works that we're doing in my lab. Uh, I want to start with this slide that uh, is a bit more broad in terms of um, all the things that we're doing in the lab. I want to. Um, one of the actually other big thing that we are interested in the lab is uh, studying decision making, which I'll not talk about today. But we have a number of papers and projects um, trying to understand how uh, animals uh, make adaptive decisions. Um, so these are decisions that are made in environments that are uncertain and unpredictable. Um, we're also interested more interested recently in value based decisions, which is how they make decisions based on their past choices and actions. Um, so that's not something that I'll talk about today. But um, if you have any question on on those areas, I'm happy to answer uh, via emails or later. Um, instead, what I'll talk about today is our second focus in the lab, which is um, trying to understand drug function, in particular in relevance to the dendritic function and also the um, dendritic dysfunction uh, in the frontal cortex. Mostly, I'll talk about ketamine work. I'll touch upon a little bit in terms of our um, work on models for neuropsychiatric disorders. And then underpinning all of those study, I think, is a uh, appreciation and use of optical imaging methods. So I'll show you plenty of data using uh, mostly two photon microscopy, um, but also op uh, just generally optical methods. Some of which we're also interested in developing um, to try to study these uh, problems. Uh, so I'll start uh, by framing the research uh, in the context of depression. Uh, Major depressive disorder and uh, mental illnesses in general are obviously very debilitating and a major problem uh, in the world. Within the U.S. itself, about eight percent of the adult population uh, have at least one episode of major depressive uh, uh, major depressive episode. Uh, so that's that's actually pretty staggering, right? So if you know twelve people around you, one person uh, will have at least experienced one time 
depression in their lifetime. About half of the people there have very severe impairment. Uh, so by that, I mean, it's so debilitating that they cannot uh, function properly, whether going to work or maybe even in their daily life. And then this is um, also twice as likely for women uh, relative to men. Uh, the, one of the issues with depression is that, also with other mental illnesses, is that there are medications, but they are very slow and they work for too few people. So the common first line treatment would be SSRI, such as Prozac, which takes about six weeks to reach a response. Uh, so that's quite slow, compared, especially when you consider that depression can come with suicidal thoughts. And that's something that you want to correct for right away. Uh, and then even with multiple rounds of treatment, about 30% of the people, about one third of them, uh, ultimately just do not respond. And once you're getting off the treatment, a lot of the people also relapse and go back and have problems again. So it was quite exciting um, in the US last year, uh, the uh, uh, Food and Drug uh, Agency, FDA, approved this drug, um, uh, which is based on the compound uh, as ketamine or related compound ketamine, which I'll talk about. It's a nasal spray. It's a new um, agent, a drug that can be used to target and fight uh, depression. Although you can see here also in the um, one of the uh, premier newspaper in US, the New York Times also mentioned that even though this drug has shown promise as an antidepressant, uh, its properties are still not very un well understood. And I think that's quite true in the sense that, you know, the clinical trial showed that this drug worked, but the discovery of the drug, which I'll talk a little bit about even, um, is quite serendipitous. So it was discovered by accident and we don't really know why it worked. It was not found, uh, I mean, there is some motivation, but it's not really discovered, I think, in a very rational way. So the idea is that if we can know more about the properties, like what this drug actually um, does in the brain, then we might have a better chance on improving the drug or finding other compounds that might have similar um, therapeutic properties. Uh, so, I mean, there's no complete lack of idea how ketamine works. In fact, there are a lot of models on how it works, right? We just don't know which one is right. I think one of the more prominent models is the neurotrophic model uh, for antidepressant action. So consider here, you have a neuron, this is brain cell, here's a cell body, and you have the very elaborate exuberant dendritic tree. And obviously you have the dendritic spine that goes on the dendrites um, and which would connect with axon and form the neuronal connections in the brain. Um, the neurotrophic model uh, basically says that uh, stress uh, potentially weaken the synapses, whether it's structurally by completely eliminating them or uh, weaken the synaptic strength. Uh, and then the antidepressant then may act to counteract that. So what I mean is like it might increase the number of spines or uh, strengthen those synapses. It's a fairly straightforward, I think, simple framework. Uh, and then this might preferentially act on certain areas in the brain, for example, the frontal cortex or the hippocampus to alleviate depression. And the molecular pathway that thought to be involved would be uh, things that are neurotrophic factors or other kinds of um, synaptogenesis related pathways. And I think there's quite a lot of uh, data supporting that these molecular machineries are indeed activated by antidepressants from work such as from Ron Duman's lab and Lisa Montega's lab and many other people showing that likely that this molecular um, mechanism is involved in any depressant action. Um, however, I think one of the key questions that um, is, interests me, and I think it's quite important for the field, is that, okay, you can have plasticity and you, those molecules are important, but their molecules are almost everywhere. Like some of the factors like BDNF uh, or mTOR exist in every single neuron and almost every single um, dendrite that you, would, you could find. It's very prevalent. But you might not want actually plasticity everywhere. You don't want your whole brain to become changeable and plastic. So how can this plasticity might be directed to certain regions? I already mentioned that frontal region and hippocampus might be particularly important and there's a lot of reason to expect that these drugs act on only some regions. How does it target certain cell types and or maybe even spines? So how can we make some of the circuit more plastic in order for the antidepressant to work? Um, but not make the whole brain so plastic that you would lose things that you don't want to lose. Um, so the idea that I'll try to present to you today, uh, which is, I think, supported by some of our data, um, but I think remain to be further tested, is that we believe that these drugs might alter um, the membrane excitability of dendrites up here, uh, and also modulate the calcium dynamics there, the signaling. 
which we think have a play a pretty strong role in steering that plasticity process to certain cell types, certain brain areas, and maybe even specific spines. Um, so calcium is quite is quite well known to have a very uh, important roles in uh, gating uh, synaptic plasticity. So here, these are very classic work now from I think almost thirty years ago, uh, showing this is uh, one experiment showing that calcium is essential for synaptic plasticity. So they have these light um, activated calcium buffers. So if you shine light onto the compound, it would then uh, engage the buffer and it basically chelate, chelate and take out all the calcium within the cell. So you can see that if you do something like LTP induction and then um, take away all the calcium, the LTP could still work. But if you just reverse that order, in time and you take out the calcium first and then do the LTP, you see that it's almost completely abolished. So experiments such as these shows that calcium are really essential and um, necessary uh, as a second messenger um, for synaptic potentiation, which now I think is you know, almost common knowledge. And since then, other people um, have also mapped out the very detailed these biochemical signaling pathways, showing again calcium have a very leading role in synaptic components uh, compartments leading to activation of various kinds of downstream uh, molecules that eventually lead to things like spine growth, um, what we typically associate with plasticity. Um, so this is, I think, some of the motivation why we focus on calcium as an indicator for the dendritic excitability. Um, so this is, again, uh, the uh, uh, framework that I'll propose to you, and I'll show the data later. Um, but just to frame, again, the whole discussion here, um, I think here is the classic neurotrophic model um, that has been, I think, fairly well supported with the neurotrophic factor leading to neuroplasticity. Um, what we're saying is that it would be helpful to consider dendritic excitability and calcium, which we know are essential for driving these signals. Um, and then uh, as a result, I think the important though, the implication is that these excitabilities can be quite um, strongly regulated by uh, circuit uh, interaction. So interaction between neurons as well as cellular interaction, which then might steer the plasticity towards certain location. And then obviously all of this is driven by fast acting antidepressants such as ketamine. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will first uh, talk about some work that we use imaging to track the remodeling of dendrites. I'll talk about some uh, other work trying to look at dynamical signal, calcium signaling in spines. I'll circle back to um, talk more about what we think are the implications uh, on these ac uh, the actions of the drugs on dendrite. And finally, I'll share some uh, just ongoing study, what we're doing right now in terms of uh, advancing this framework. Uh, so ketamine is a very interesting compound. Uh, it has many effects uh, on the human brain. Uh, if you give a single dose of ketamine uh, to a human subject, a healthy human subject, for example, uh, you would get something like this, where uh, initially, acutely, within an hour, uh, within the first two hours or so, actually, but it peaks at an hour, you have a very pronounced psychotomimetic effect. So, which means that you have perceptual distortion. Um, you might you might start seeing things that you're not supposed to see. You also have some cognitive symptoms like impairments in your working memory. However, there's also a sustained effect. Um, so uh, starting about four hours and now it's been extended up to maybe about two weeks, you have this effect where you actually get an antidepressant effect. So this is a, again, a, in humans, so they have a battery of uh, uh, tests, uh, which is like a questionnaire to, to determine your depressive uh, severity. You can see that it's a pretty substantial, uh, notable uh, antidepressant effect that's sustained. Um, you might think that this is relatively uh, uh, late. I guess it is true compared to when the drug is on the body. By the time it's about 70 minutes is the half-life of the drug. By the time the, the antidepressant effect kicked in, the drug has largely been washed out of the body. Um, but still, you know, this four hour onset is relatively quick relative to SSRI. So it's still a relatively rapid onset antidepressant effect. And the good thing is it's somewhat sustained for about two weeks. Um, so we're interested in, you know, again, how this antidepressant effect comes about. Um, if you look at uh, whole brain uh, data, you know, where to begin, uh, there's good evidence in both humans and mice that the frontal cortex is a good place to start. This is a PET study showing where metabolically uh, ketamine induces activation in the brain in human. It's pretty broad, actually, you can see. Um, definitely includes some areas in the frontal cortex as being a notable activation. 
This is what happens in the mouse. If you give the mouse a single dose of ketamine, uh, you see that uh, it preferentially activates the medial frontal area, uh, including some of the dorsal area that we're going to uh, study. Uh, but it does spare some of the other sensory motor areas uh, that are more lateral uh, in the frontal cortex. Uh, so one of the big proponents, as I mentioned, uh, of the neurotrophic uh, model is uh, Ron Duman. Uh, unfortunately, Ron Duman has uh, recently passed away. So he was a very uh, good colleague, uh, very good friend uh, in, the, in, my, in my department. Uh, and this was a photo I, I took with, with him uh, uh, three years ago. Um, but he was one of the early champions of the neurotrophic model and also have provided a good amount of evidence that ketamine could um, have uh, uh, important effects on dendrites in the frontal cortex. This was one of his study uh, 10 years ago now, showing that if you inject ketamine into the mouse, uh, I think in this case actually rats, you do see a, a substantial increase in the number of spines, again, supporting the idea that it really can increase the number of spines uh, to restore maybe some of those uh, lost connections in depression. Uh, where we come in is that we thought that, you know, you can see that ketamine increased spine density, that like there are a number of ways that this could occur, right? You can, for example, have an increase in the formation rate. You can have them form more often. Uh, you can decrease the elimination uh, or maybe both. And also what's interesting to us is the time course of the structural remodeling. Uh, how does it change over time? I think that's quite relevant if you think about the time course of the actual therapeutic effect of that drug um, in depression. Because um, right now here, what Ron did was more static, right? So he, um, I think, injected the drug and then cut the brain out 24 hours later, and you don't really know that full time course. Um, so as I mentioned, we are, uh, you know, uh, quite invested in optical imaging technologies. So we have uh, two to four time rigs in the lab, and this is um, work done by a uh, postgraduate researcher in the lab, Victoria. Um, now, actually, several years ago, one of our first studies in ketamine in the brain. So she uh, replaced the cranium with a glass window and then could image directly into the dorsal area of the medial prefrontal cortex of the mouse. She uses the Taiwan GFP mice, which constituently express uh, green fluorescent protein in layer five parameter neurons. And if you use a microscope in a live mouse and you go into the brain, into the cortex, this is how you would, uh, what you would see. You see that basically the dendritic branches and alberizations, and you're taking a Z-stack going down. You can already see that um, you know, on the uh, dendrite, you can see the spines quite clearly. And this is not, you don't see the cell body, which is too deep. And this is really just the apical tuft, the, um, the fanning pattern up on the top of the, uh, of the cortex on the superficial layers. Um, so I'll go through this quickly. This is already several years ago. We have a very simple design where we inject either ketamine or saline into the mouse. We're imaging, and again, the idea is to ask whether you have more spine that form, or maybe you have more elimination or less elimination, uh, ultimately then lead to a change in the uh, spine density. Um, this is what Victoria found. She found that there was a pretty dramatic effect on the spine formation rate. Uh, you can see here for ketamine, spine formation rate clearly increased um, relative to saline. Although if you compare between the elimination rate, which is the empty square here with the empty square here and the saline, there's really not much different. So there's really this divergence in the formation from the elimination rate and particularly the increase in the spine formation that seems to drive this um, relative increase in spine density in the frontal cortex. Um, one other thing that we can do also with optical imaging that you cannot do uh, just by uh, doing histology is that you know, just because you have a spine doesn't mean that you actually have a synapse, right? So there are also these um, new spines like the philopodia has not matured yet and doesn't have that machinery, in, in including the postsynaptic density to actually function as a mature synapse. It's thought that um, you need about four days at least for, for these uh, proteins to get recruited and for the uh, synapse to form to be functional. So one thing we can do in optical imaging is you can track these spines over four days or even more um, and see the spine mature and maybe even grow in terms of the size to know that th these are indeed uh, bec can become mature synapse. And this is something that we found, you know, uh, a fraction of these spines, although not all of them, in fact, um, some of them do, uh, do retract and uh, are not persistent, but there is a good fraction of it that are persistent and in fact uh, become bona fide synapses uh, due to ketamine administration, suggesting again that it's not only just spine, you really do form new synapses. 
One of the somewhat unexpected results from here that we don't quite know how to interpret, but it was very striking was not only we see increase in spine, but we also observe um, some retraction in uh, tufts. So here is one case where you can see before we can see a, a pretty prominent uh, a tufts right here uh, of a whole branch that seems to disappear actually. And you can show, we can show that it is true because you can go up and down with a microscope to show that really this branch has disappeared whereas everything else is intact. Um, and this loss of some branches seem to be very specific to the day of ketamine injection. And it's not sustained, so it's really at the time of the injection. So summarizing this structural part, um, what we see is that we see um, some connection. So let me explain this picture here. So what I'm drawing here is a cartoon, right, with a bunch of dendrites and the thin red and blue lines are the axon that you, if you will, imagine coming in. What I'm telling you is that we saw, you know, spine uh, formation, increase in spine formation. So you see uh, the, more of the black spines here now. And then we also see some branches, tufts that could um, be removed, but these are more immediate of a retraction. Um, so this led us to a model, at least structurally, where you have some uh, uh, connection being added while other connection being removed. And we think that this might lead to uh, a, a case where you might start receiving more input from one region, depending on where you add and where you subtract, you can tilt the balance of where the input uh, may come from for the frontal cortex. Um, this kind of idea obviously remains to be tested. Uh, uh, so we're, we're one of the project, one of the MD PhD students in the lab right now is quite interested in looking at different input, for example, from amygdala or from the thalamus and see whether this kind of idea might be true. That maybe ketamine, yes, it, it does increase spine density, but maybe it does so in a more subtle way um, that it actually rebalances the, the input um, rather than just adding a lot of new inputs. Um, so that's the first part, and I kind of try to go back to the framework here. You know, we're studying ketamine, and I show you uh, some evidence, along with a lot of existing work already, of neuroplasticity, in our case, uh, increased rate of spine formation. Um, but I want to get back at this key point here, which is the calcium and the dendrite, which we think also play a very important role in this process. Um, so Farhan in the lab, Farhan is a, was a postdoc in the lab. Uh, he now has his own lab uh, in Singapore in Nanyang University. Uh, he uh, injected um, viruses to uh, express genetically encoded calcium indicators. So that way we can not only look at the structure of the dendrite, but also look at dynamical signals uh, related to um, calcium uh, level changes, calcium concentration inside the dendrite. So this is a kind of image that Farhan would see. You can see that the signal is very dynamic, both in terms of spatially, uh, but also temporally. It's actually a very complex type of signal. Um, and hopefully you can also see uh, uh, maybe some spine uh, type of uh, uh, signal, but I'll, I'll also zoom in. Again, like we're imaging really the superficial area where the dendrites are, just the tufts. Um, so you think about where calcium can come in in the dendrites. Uh, there are also a number of bio, uh, biological processes, physiological processes that, that could occur. Calcium could come in, for example, when the spine is activated, when, the, when, when it receives synaptic input, like there's uh, for example, glutamate release on the presynaptic side. Um, then you have NMD receptor open and then calcium can come in, which would be very local. But you could also have some more global events. So these would be things like back propagating actual potential with dendritic spikes that are actually regenerative current that would excite uh, a lot of the um, uh, larger chunk of the dendrite. So we can resolve some of that with the imaging. So here is a zoom in version of that um, image I show you and hopefully you can see sometimes that uh, uh, this spine, for example, is very clear where you can sometimes see very localized uh, uh, signal, just that spine. Other times you can see the whole dendrite lit up. Um, so these will be some of these local and more widespread events. Um, so here's a still frame showing what I mean. You can sometimes see again just the spine lit up, suggesting it's a local synaptic activation. Sometimes you can see a more widespread event. Um, these events have different uh, implication for plasticity. Um, some people think that this kind of uh, dendritic spike is very important uh, for plasticity, um, although obviously localized event, as I showed earlier with the biochemical signaling, can also activate the, um, uh, can also activate a cascade to induce uh, strengthening. Um, so in this talk, at least, we'll focus on the local influx, um, which reflect the synaptic activation. Um, so we do a number of data analysis methods to regress out the widespread component and really try to convert some of these calcium uh, signal to events. Um, 
you know, I tell you that we can do this to localize a local component, right? But you shouldn't take it just for granted. And then we also did some experiments to show that this is indeed true, that what we measure in that spine is really related to the local event. One way we can do it is to do two color imaging. Uh, so here is also still two photon imaging, but we injected two different genetically indicated, uh, encoded calcium indicated. One is red, the other is green. We put the red in the dendrite and the green in the axon. And uh, you can identify things that are adjacent to each other that are opposing spine and axon of boutons. And if, you, uh, if they are indeed coupled, then you would expect whenever the axon say activated, you would detect the same signal in the spine. Right? And indeed that is the case. Um, so here's the bouton, here's the spine. They're not exactly directly correlated. Um, you know, sometimes a calcium can go in the bouton, but there, uh, there might not be a release, right? That's a, it's a stochastic event, uh, but they are fairly correlated. And if we do an analysis um, between correlated adjacent boutons and spine pairs versus ones that are shuffled, we see that uh, most of the cases about um, when, when, when they're adjacent, about 60% of the events are indeed correlated. So the majority of the event that we are imaging in the spine are indeed uh, have a correlate on the presynaptic side. So they're indeed related to synaptic activation. Um, so the design of the experiment is quite simple. Uh, it's very related to the ones we had before. Here we're just looking at calcium signal. We inject ketamine or saline, and then we see what happens um, to the calcium dynamics in the spines. Um, what we found is a very notable, and I think, um, uh, somewhat unexpected increase um, in the synaptic calcium uh, signals in the uh, spine compartments after the injection of ketamine. So here are two spines that we track uh, in the same uh, branch. And against here, I think the strength of these type of studies is that within subject design. You can look at the same animals and really go before or after. We could potentially you know, even look at days after, which we haven't done in this case. Um, but you can really track the same spine and ask what happened to it. Uh, so here you can see that for the saline, there's not much of change, but then for the ketamine, you see a pretty increase, uh, a significant increase in the, um, uh, both the amplitude and the frequency of the calcium events, which we can quantify um, from, you know, hundreds of spines that behind this image. Um, so if you see an increase in the synaptic calcium transient in the spine right here, there could be a number of reasons for why that is happening. One possibility is maybe this spines get more excitable. So you have an increase in the memory excitability. So for the same amount of input, it, it really sensitive now and responsive. Or maybe you have actually elevated presynaptic firing. So uh, you have more neurotransmitter being released. As a result, you detect an increase in the postsynaptic side, or it could be both. So they try to isolate this uh, possibilities and actually try to, especially try to understand the postsynaptic side uh, Fahan did one additional experiment, um, which is uh, to control the input. So previously, we were measuring just spontaneous uh, synaptic calcium signal, um, just let the brain do its thing. But right now, if we can control the input, then you can try to start identifying whether it's the input that's changed or the output that's changed. And to do this, uh, he used an electrode uh, to excite the axonal afferents. So it's known that retrosplenial uh, cortex have a pretty strong projection to the frontal area. So he artificially stimulate and control the input, and then at the same time measure the calcium signals in the spines in the frontal cortex. And what he found is that even in this kind of regime where you control the input precisely, you can still see an increase in the responsiveness, suggesting that at least in part, what we observe is due to an um, increased postsynaptic excitability. So you can see here, he inject repeatedly um, in the retrospinial cortex, excite those axon, and you can see the increase in the responsiveness and the calcium signal in the frontal cortex. So I, I mentioned that this was uh, unexpected to us. Um, and the reason is that if you think again about how calcium can get in here, it could go in into and day receptors. Uh, but if you know anything about ketamine, the pharmacology is that the ketamine is actually an NMDA receptor antagonist, so it should block NMDA receptors. So it's very unexpected that something that would actually should reduce calcium influx by blocking the uh, one of the main calcium permeable receptors actually lead to an increase in synaptic calcium. Um, one possibility we thought would be that maybe, um, you know, there's also uh, additional cortical circuitry around it. Um, and then uh, blockade of other kinds of neurons, particularly neurons that project to dendrite that control these areas, um, the inhibition in these areas. 
might play a role. And you can think of a scheme where if you block the receptors, make these neurons less responsive, that would relieve the inhibition, specifically at the dendrite, uh, dendritic compartment, that could then actually raise excitability and um, lead to that increase in the calcium influx that we saw. So we look for evidence for this kind of change. And um, one of the things, good things about imaging is now there are a lot of genetic targeting strategies. So we also can put the calcium indicator specifically on the, these dendrite targeting somal cyan neurons in the cortex. Indeed, when we look at the cell body, as well as when we look at specifically at the dendrites in the layer one, so these are going to be the input that goes on the dendrite, we see that there is a reduction in their um, activity levels, suggesting that this kind of this inhibition scheme is, um, can be supported by just directly looking at the activity. Um, not only can we do that, we can also um, try to do causal perturbation to show that this pathway is quite important. Uh, so here we uh, collaborated with Ron um, to uh, generate this AAV mediated strategy. Um, so it's a pre-dependent SHRNA to knock down and they reset the subunit, gluon 2 b um, So we inject this AAV in there into the somalostatin um, cre mice, then we can have a specific knockdown of the gluon 2 b in these inner neurons. So you would expect that if you knock down the NMDA receptors here, the subunit, you would um, well, first of all, you, you should reproduce some of the ketamine's effect. Um, so you would reduce these uh, uh, neuron uh, sectivity, but you would, um, and then also uh, in the reproduce the effect in the synaptic calcium, but also you should render uh, additional ketamine ineffective because you're already knocking them down. So if you additionally add ketamine, it should not do anything. So indeed, that's also what we saw. Um, this is just a summary of many experiments, but this is really the key point where when we do the knockdown with this SHRNA, we see that you, you can, um, and then you image now the spines and the parameter neurons, you can see that you can recapitulate that uh, finding that we saw, you can see this increase in the synaptic calcium transient in the parameter neurons. And furthermore, if you add ketamine now, it doesn't really do anything. So linking this to um, depressive-like behavior, Ron's lab have used the same uh, virus and then also tested a variety of depressive like behavior um, using assays like uh, forced swim tests and novelty suppressed feeding and so forth to show that this knockdown is also important for the antidepressant effect of ketamine in mice. Um, here our work really show focuses on the calcium signaling and show that it's a very strong immediate effect on the calcium signaling. Um, so I do want to link it back to some of what people have earlier have found in this area. You know, we're not the first one to show um, some disinhibition associated with NMDA receptor antagonists. Um, but I think what we show here to you is a focus on the dendritic part, uh, where we see this elevated calcium signal in a dendrite, um, decrease in their activity, um, uh, these dendrite targeting neurons. Um, I didn't show you the data. We also found use electrophysiology measuring LFP. Uh, to show that it also changes long-range cortical connectivity when you mess with this uh, dendritic inhibition uh, circuit. And it contrasts actually quite, uh, I think, starkly with some of the uh, current idea of disinhibition, which tend to focus on um, inhibition of the somatic uh, uh, inhibition, so, uh, so which would be PV interneurons. So these are, um, this idea is championed by um, and uh, people uh, such as Abida Mohanam and John Lisman uh, showing that, um, and it consistent with a lot of finding as well. So if you, if you have this inhibition in the soma, soma, then it's associated with elevated uh, parameter activity, um, which Beta's lab has elegantly show, um, as well as decreased fast spiking cell activity in aberrant gamma band oscillations. So I think one of the interesting ideas going forward and would be fun to test would be whether these type of in disinhibition pathway act in parallel uh, in the brain um, like do they, uh, both of them contribute to the antidepressant effect or are they, um, are they separate? Maybe one of these are more important. It's not really clear. Um, also do they, yeah, again, do they act in parallel or do, do they act in tandem? Maybe you need both of them and maybe they are affecting each other and they're both of the components are quite important, um, in terms of the pharmacology of ketamine. Um, so. Um, going back to the framework, uh, so ketamine, so we provided some evidence that it induces um, uh, elevation in the synaptic calcium signal, then that we think that this is quite important then later on to drive these biochemical signaling and neurotrophic factors that other people have um, already observed and widely reported uh, with these drugs. But the important part is, um, you know, these calcium uh, signals are quite strongly regulated by the circuit interaction, in this case, the somatostatin neuron um, circuitry.
So I think it's fun to think about what this means. Um, so if you have these structural changes and calcium signaling changes, um, what does it mean in terms of the uh, uh, function of these NAD proteins? One of the things to think about is where are these inhibition on the dendrite? Um, I think there is um, good evidence from the electron microscope that uh, microscopy that the inhibition is actually uh, on only some portion of the dendrite. Um, in fact, it's also mostly on the shaft, so it's not on the spines. Uh, so this is uh, early work um, from a Japanese group, the Kawaguchi group, showing that if you do electron microscopy and look at exactly where these synapses occur, you see the inhibition uh, right here. These are symmetric synapses on the EM. You also see excitatory pathways, um, uh, synapses coming in here. But you already see um, here, for example, you have a, syn have a spine that is very close to an uh, inhibitory synapse. So these could be pretty strongly influenced by this inhibition. But you also have spines that are quite far that would not perhaps by influenced by the inhibition. Um, so you see uh, a probably gradient uh, of effects uh, when you have when you have when you put on ketamine. Um, so this is the idea that we have basically. Um, uh, we think that uh, that this inhibition could be quite localized depending on where those SST neuron synapse on the pyramidal neurons. Uh, here we just show you one SST neuron. Obviously you have many of them. Uh, so you have this place, you have this idea where now you have heterogeneity of uh, where the dendritic excitability may be increased and in some cases might be decreased by the direct action on the NMD receptor on the dendritic tree. Um, so one way, one reason why this is important is we show that the calcium influx could be quite important for plasticity. This would suggest that certain parts of the dendritic tree might be preferentially um, experiencing this increase in the plasticity potential. Um, we have some evidence for that, I think, when we look at the data that we saw, looking at the increase in the calcium signal, actually, we see that um, not all the spine have this increase in calcium signals. In fact, um, about 30 or 40% of the spines did not change the calcium signals much when you do this manipulation. So a fraction of the spine seems to have be much more responsive um, to the drug. Um, another thing I think to think about is that if indeed some outstanding neurons are quite important for this process, uh, the distribution in the brain is also not uniform. So you can have more in one area than the other. Um, relative to other kinds of inner neurons, uh, such as pilobumin inner neurons, uh, and then so you could have a shift in the balance and inhibition between dendrites and soma. Um, and if you look at this PD to SST ratio, which other people have looked at, and we recently have also mined it um, based on the Allen Brain uh, Atlas, uh, you can get data of, of the number of transcripts in the mouse. You can see this trend where um, there are indeed more, uh, relatively speaking, SST in the neuron uh, in the frontal cortex relative to the bulk of the inhibitory neurons in the frontal area, as well as some of the more interesting um, like temporal area relative to somehow sensory area and visual area. So this could perhaps um, uh, explain in part why some of these drugs might have region-specific effects, um, particularly areas that might have more of these kinds of dendrite targeting neurons. Um, and we have done some experiment along this line. Again, I have shown this image already in the mouse. It's known already that ketamine has a much stronger effect in the medial frontal area relative to, for example, the primary motor cortex. When we image the primary motor cortex, we also see that it does not have the similar effect on the synaptic calcium signal. If anything, after injecting ketamine, you see a leftward shift in your curve, meaning that you have less synaptic calcium signal. So that what we what I showed you previously about this increase in the calcium signal in the primal neurons is quite region specific uh, to the medial frontal cortex, or well, at least in comparison with the primary motor cortex. Um, so I think that's. Um, uh, a good point and now talk about maybe some of the ongoing research that we're quite excited about. Um, uh, I've shown you some evidence supporting this framework, um, but definitely I think more can be done. Some of the things that we're interested in are, um, you know, neuropsychiatric conditions. So we, the, play, the thing I've shown you right now, a lot of the work has been done in wild type mice, but obviously you want to study this in the context of depression or at least conditions that are relevant with depression. So it will be useful to look at uh, neuropsychiatric mouse models. Uh, we're also are interested in other compounds. So does this generalize? Um, you know, ketamine is just one compound. What about other compounds that might have relevant effects? And also the places that we're imaging in dendro is roughly small. What about can we image more and look at other events like the widespread calcium events that I talked about? Uh, so in terms of neuropsychiatric condition, my lab has been also quite interested in uh, chronic stress. 
uh, postdoc Florent uh, Batlas, as well as MD student Melody, um, has published some works on uh, in the lab doing social defeat. Um, so here we have a 10-day regimen of social defeat, and then we have um, behavior as well as imaging. On the behavioral part, we develop a new sucrose preference task. Um, I don't think I have that much time to try to explain this, but in effect, it's a hefix version of a social uh, hefix version of a sucrose preference task. And we can show that susceptible mice have a, a greatly reduced um, uh, preference for the sucrose relative to resilient mice in these social DP paradigms. Um, we can do imaging, uh, longitudinal imaging. Um, here we use a specific construct that allows us both to image dynamical signal from GCAM as well as static signals. So we can track the same neuron over days. We can do it almost every other day uh, in this regime, looking at what happened to the same cell pre-stress, during stress, after stress, track their trajectory over time. Um, here to show you how it looked like every single day, you can go back to the same cell. And I won't, again, go too much into this study. Um, it's published and you can read about it. What we found, at least when you image the cell body in this case, is that there are fairly heterogeneous changes in the brain um, uh, to the cell. And we found that some cells seem to correlate with some of the um, behavioral changes uh, in the sucrose preference. So they seem to track the changes in the behavior. Um, I think going forward, it would be very interesting to now look at dendrites. So all this that study with the stress in the cell body, it would be very interesting to look at the interaction of uh, ketamine with stress, but at the dendritic level. What happens even in the stress? Um, how happens does it even do alone at the spine? And then what happens when you have them interacting? Uh, another thing that's ongoing that we call quite interested in other compounds, psilocybin is a compound that recently received a lot of attention. It's a psychedelic compound but it's also been found to have potentially some rapid antidepressant effect. And in the US at least, it's been uh, designated as potential drug, uh, breakthrough therapy and there's ongoing clinical trial. Um, but regardless of the actual, I think, utility, what excites me the most about the, these compounds is that they act on serotonin receptors and they're just choke full loaded on the dendrite. So if you, if you stain them here, um, it's a Pat Goldman Rakish work at, at 20, 30 years ago at Yale. You see that these receptors, that these compound add on, are just really densely packed in the apical dendrite in the monkey uh, prefrontal cortex. Same thing for the mouse uh, work done by, done by uh, Brian Ruff. Um, so they must do something very interesting. The dendritic stability is something we want to um, study. Um, and other people in the, in, in, have also shown that these um, uh, compounds have very striking effects or related receptors, striking effect on plasticity. Um, actually, this is uh, quite a while ago, but very well cited work from Medida showing that, um, and in Ron's lab as well, when she was at Yale, showing that you know when you activate these 2A receptors, you can lead to changes molecularly, leading to increases in factors related to plasticity. More recent work showed that if you look at culture neuron, you can increase the um, structural plasticity. Um, so we just got a, uh, some of these compounds um, and we put them in mice. It's quite, quite interesting. I mean, they have a lot of interesting behavioral effect. Um, this is the well, very well-known head twitch effect if you give the mouse psychedelic. Um, I've seen this a lot in different um, plots, but I haven't seen a lot of videos of it. So we took some videos of it. This is in a normal speed. If you give the mouse drug on the left, you can see that um, it's very fast in video, just one second clip. You can't see much. But if you slow it down now, you can see this very clear head twitch effect where you can see the, the head going left and right. So these compounds already have very interesting just motor effect on its own. Um, and you don't have to train the mouse to see this. Um, and these kind of effects really relate to the hallucinogenic part of the, of the behavior for the mouse. Um, let me see. So I have a couple more slides. I'll just finish it. I think. Um, and then finally, also mentioned some uh, work trying to look at more widespread event. The motivation for that is that if you look at uh, synaptic input, which we focus on right now, you're really limited to certain kinds of dendritic events. Um, but if you go back to you know, your textbook, neuroscience textbook, you know that dendrite can actually support different kinds of electrical events, local NMDA spike, tough potential, or even um, some more global events uh, involving like, backpropagating actual potentials. It'd be very interesting to distinguish them. Uh, we think they're quite important in terms of what, the, what it means for plasticity. Um, so Neo, uh, MPPHC student in the lab is now working on improving the imaging uh, methods. So we now uh, in the lab have the capability to not only image a small field of view, but to image now multiple field of views. You can split the field of views and track the same, same dendritic branch. Um, and then also to look at different Z plane. So not only at the tufts out here, but also in the trunk, so you can uh, 
uh, again, try to really capture that whole dendritic tree to see if we can um, visualize what the drug does. Um, we're also interested in some neurobiosensor, not only calcium, but you can now you know, image things like glutamate and neuromodulators. Uh, so this is it, um, a summary. Uh, you know, I tell you about the drug, which is very important for treating depression, but we don't know how it works. I've told you that it increases the number of spine uh, dry formation rate. I've shown you that it increases um, calcium transient, which was a bit unexpected. Um, show you some evidence that it does that through a circuit interaction with the dendrite targeting neurons. Um, I've given you a model, which I think is somewhat supported. Um, some evidence again, but also still not, not quite sure yet, right? I'll show you that cartoon with the red and blue um, uh, changes in excitability, but it really needs to be confirmed. And we're trying to develop some new imaging technology to try to really image that dendritic tree to, to pin that down. Um, you know, we could be wrong, but I still think it's, it's quite important to know what is actually happening there. And with the ultimate goal that I think this kind of signature at the neuron and neural circuit and system level could be quite important for identifying new compounds that might have similar effects in the brain. Um, so with that, uh, you know, this is my lab. Uh, I've tried to point out um, how they have helped in the various part of the project. Collaborators, um, Ron Duman, uh, Marina Picciotto, Chris Pittinger at Yale, um, the psychedelics, we've gotten them for the USONA Institute, um, as well as uh, I want to thank the funding support. Um, so that is it. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Alex. That was a very wonderful and insightful talk. Plus, uh, personally, I'm really excited that you're asking such interesting questions and also working on developing the neuroimaging techniques and microscope techniques that are needed to study these patterns. And being from a physics background, I would say that it's um, microscopes and optical imaging is, is like the backbone of the field. Without these advancements, it's very difficult for us to understand what is happening inside the brain. So you are targeting these two things in parallel. It's, it's really has given me a lot of motivation to, now I know how to proceed in this field further with my background in physics. So thank you so much. And I would like you to take questions. So first, Manusmriti is asking, since calcium signals hold so much importance, to what extent in your opinion, can the mitochondria and the autophagic processes be involved in this process? Yeah, so I, I have, um, uh, I have kind of uh, pitched this idea that the uh, calcium uh, yeah, comes in through the dendrite, uh, comes in through you know NMDA receptors and uh, voltage gated channels, and then go into the second messenger pathway. But as you pointed out, calcium obviously can have. Well, not only can cal calcium also have other sources like internal calcium stores, and then downstream calcium could also be important for other things, yeah, like in mitochondria and other type of processes. Um, so I think all of those are kind of somewhat unknown. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think those could also play a very important role, and they're somewhat understudy in terms of what the drugs can do. Um, and I also did not mention, but uh, uh, for the psychedelics, which we're quite interested in now. Um, it also go, these, these, these uh, compounds um, act on the serotonin receptor, which is G-protein coupled receptors also regulate calcium that way. So I think it's, yeah, it's not, not gonna be like a flow chart, like simple like this. There's gonna be, I think more parts to it that we need to understand. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Thank you, Manusmriti, for your question. Uh, the next question is by Kimi. So she is saying the functions of ketamine seem to be similar to the activity of acetyl chlorine esterase in terms of altered synaptic architectures, including spine formation, arborization, et cetera, can we replace ketamine with uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors to improve neurocognitive symptoms in Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, so I think um, if you think about what we uh, currently know, or think about uh, neuropsychiatric disorders or uh, Alzheimer's disease or neurological disorder, um, the general idea, general picture is that they definitely important for dendritic spines. Some of them increase, some of them decrease. You know, maybe schizophrenia is increased, autism is decreased, depression is decreased. It's, it's, it's a bit hard to make sense of it, right? Because, and a lot of these drugs seem to also change the synapse number. So I think what we try to do is to ask more precise questions, like where are these synapse increase? And also um, what are the inputs that are then um, uh, specific to these increase? 
uh, I think that might be a more fruitful avenue to go forward. So you're right, there are a lot of drugs that could increase the number of synapses and strengthen synapses, but I think there should be more specificity to that because they do lead to different phenotypes. And these drugs ultimately do have different actions on humans. So I think, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be useful to ask yeah, how these drugs differ in terms of some more details about what they do to synapses. Um, thank you. Uh, so our next question is by Ankush. He's asking how different are the effects of SSRIs from rapid acting antidepressants like ketamine? Is more dendritic spines building up C for SSRIs too? Yeah, that's something that we have thought about and it's quite interesting because if you, um, SSRI also changes uh, serotonin. Uh, so, I mean, I guess we, I didn't talk much about, this is again, just an idea, but um, you could ask, you know, why some of these psychedelic might have interesting effect, but not SSRI, or you can even ask, why does endogenous serotonin in our brain, which also activate these receptor, um, they don't, I mean, they don't give us hallucination. Uh, I think, I think those are actually very open questions. Uh, <laughs> you guys are asking a lot of uh, interesting open questions that I think deserve more uh, experiments. And um, yeah, it would be very interesting to look at, do some kind of similar dendritic experiments, uh, like looking at calcium signals, but with SSRI and see what happens. I don't know if these experiments have been done. Um, okay, um, thank you. So we have Dr. Vidita who wants to ask you a question. So I would request Dr. Vidita to kindly come on the screen and ask a question. Self. Oh, okay, great. It did allow me to unmute myself. Hi, Alex. Hi, nice Vidita. to see you. Um, qu a quick question on whether you think the architectural changes are predominantly restricted to projection neurons, or you think uh, PV and SST neurons will show similar calcium signal and, um, you know, architectural changes. And what are your thoughts on the persistence of these effects, especially given hallucinogenic compounds are associated with perceptual flashbacks? Do you think you might see you know, very long lasting disruption of calcium signaling that may persist long after uh, drug exposure? Yeah, so I think that the time course is a very interesting question here. Uh, so for the, uh, there are multiple parts of the question, right? For the calcium, what, when we are, what we're imaging is a more acute time scale. We're looking at calcium changes that happens within an hour or two. What we think is that that's a pretty rapid thing and then eventually lead to this downstream cascade and going back to the neurotrophic model um, and also the uh, molecular uh, signature that you, know, you and others have shown that are then important for the more longer term plasticity. We just think that it's kind of one of the first steps in this process that then lead to that long lasting change. Uh, and then um, on the other aspect, uh, which is the uh, changes for the psychedelic in terms of the distorted perception. That's an interesting point because uh, psychedelic and ketamine essay right here, they have very different uh, acute effect. Um, so if you, if, if, you, if you give it a human that who have used these drugs, they can tell the difference very readily. In fact, even within some psychedelics, people can tell the differences quite readily. Um, so they, they're definitely not equivalent in this case. And um, what they do to the dendrite and how they affect it uh, could be quite different. So I guess what I want to say is um, they definitely also do not only affect right, frontal cortex and hippocampus. And um, uh, I think the short-term effect might be involved with how they affect different areas. So Chris Neo has a pretty interesting study showing that psychedelic can have direct effect on the visual cortex. So that's something that might be absent for ketamine and might be more responsive for, for the hallucination. And then for the ketamine, I also want to mention on the time course, um, what we think this calcium, again, neurotrophic factor, uh, I think is a longer time scale thing, right? But there's also the shorter time scale, rapid onset within four hours. So that could be something else as well that we don't quite understand. I think there's some suggestion, maybe the lyra habendula, there might be also some direct effect on the strengthening that doesn't really quite fit with this framework as well yet. But I think, yeah, those are, that is also another kind of important question of the, and kind of unknown in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we have our next question from Nasa Kumar. Uh, ketamine is commonly used as an anesthetic and is associated with memory loss. 
So with reference to that, will the neurons in the hippocampus have an increased spine density? Yeah, so ketamine, uh, depending on dose you use, have very different effect. So the dose that I, uh, I, I show is a sub-anesthetic dose. Um, so you don't get an, a, 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 the anesthesia effect when you give the mouse at about five to 10 mg per K. Instead, you actually even, behaviorally, you also see hyperlocomotion. They walk around more. Uh, so it's very dose dependent. Uh, if you use a higher dose, so an anesthetic dose, then obviously you go into anesthesia and you have a decrease in neural activity. And Matthew Lockham's lab actually has a pretty elegant, I think a cell paper last year showing that if you at that higher dose, you also see very striking uh, effect on dendritic uh, signal. But what they see is a complete segregation. So it becomes very segregated and electrotonically distant. So they're not, they're electrically discoupled or uncoupled. Um, so yeah, depending on the different doses, you can have different effects on the dendritic signal. Um, but here we're doing the sub-anesthetic dose, um, which is more relevant for a depressive disorder. Okay, so I'll be taking the last question for the talk and it's from Sudipta Sarkar. For the very initial test of verification of action of ketamine for increased spine generation or decreased spine degradation, why do you think there was a drop in degradation both in the case of saline buffer and ketamine? Oh, sorry, can you repeat that question? Um, for the very initial test of verification of action of ketamine for increased spine generation or decreased spine degradation, why do you think there was a drop in degradation both in case of saline buffer and ketamine? Oh, I see. You mean why is there... Um, oh. You mean in the spine density test? Yeah, why is there a drop in the degradation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, we report what we saw. So <laughs> um, it was a, a bit unexpected why even a saline animal seemed to have a drop in the spine density or the spine formation rate in this case, but it lead to a drop in spine density, even if we give the animal saline. Uh, we think that that might be a little bit of an artifact of the experiment. So, uh, well, first of all, we were using adolescent animals. So these are younger animals. and there probably still a little bit of pruning going on as the animal develop and grow older. But more importantly, I think, um, you know, when we do these imaging, we are anesthetizing them every other day. And these are pretty long uh, imaging experiments to try to image the dendritic tree. That could itself be somewhat stressful to the animal. Um, so yeah, we, we do see uh, some changes in spine uh, number, even in the control animal. Um, so, but I think, let me see. We have some newer, uh, so we are definitely doing more of that kind of study for the psychedelic, but with a slightly different design. So we can see if we can try to avoid that in the future. Um, but it's actually not that uncommon. If you look at some of the other uh, experiments looking at frontal cortex with two photon imaging over time, some, well, often you still see some decrease. In fact, we cited some of those papers. They just don't mention it that much. Okay, so we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Alex, for joining us today. and. Thank you for such a wonderful and interesting talk.